Hey guys, Doug Giles here. Cold beer time. Cigar. And my buddy, my warrior and wild man, amigo. I'm talking about Rich Whitmer. Rich, how you doing, brother? Doug Giles. What's up, man? Good to see you here on Warriors and Wild Men again. I always get excited when we get together and talk about things and stuff. What's going on? I had this guy who said, why you drink beer, man? You know, that's the devil's brew. And I was like, I thought whiskey was the devil's brew. But anyway, um, he, and he's got a picture on Facebook, and he's holding this big-ass, like, 64-ounce big gulp. I mean, it's so huge, you could park, <laughs> you could park a jet ski in it. And it's uh, and it's Coke. And have you ever seen what Coke does to your stomach acid? Nobody wants to talk about real life and real stuff, Doug. They want to sit back and be self-righteous, talk about your beer. So hey, brother, cheers. I know it's early over there in Arizona. You drink a little some some coffee. Love my coffee. Some liberal tears. I'm still enjoying the liberal tears this morning. Oh, you're such a hater, man. Hey, um, uh, let's talk about a topic I don't hear diddly squat about, especially in the hipster groovy. Uh, Millennial Church, buddy. Let's talk about the fear of God. Nobody preaches on the fear of God anymore. I don't. I don't hear it. It's all well, Richard. You see, it's not seeker friendly. Nobody wants to hear the so scary, scary aspects of God. But Paul said to the church in Rome uh, when he wrote that uh, illustrious letter that I think uh, lines out the gospel better than any other uh, letter that that he or anybody else penned. He said that uh, the believer's got to do two things, all right? You must behold God's kindness. you got to get a stranglehold on his love, his mercy, sacrifice of his son, the forgiveness of sins. If you don't have that as an anchor, you're going to be all over the place. You're going to think you're saved, unsaved, saved, unsaved, saved. I mean, you're going to go nuts. It's going to drive you crazy. And, uh, and a lot of Christians need to, to understand that, and they need to, you know, have that as a foundation stone. Paul also said you also need to behold God's severity. And um, those are, those are <laughs> they seem like complete two polar opposites, but they're part and parcel of God's multifaceted character. But you don't hear, like I said, man, you don't hear squat about the fear of God anymore. It's so passe. It's so not talked about. And yet it's so very foundational and important if you want to have this thing called a relationship with the true God that's defined uh, in Christ and through the scripture. Yep. And, and I'll start off with something very deep, uh, a quote from Chronicles of Narnia. When they go to see the lion and he asks, he says, the young guy says, is he safe? And the response is, no, he's not safe, but he's good. That's how God is right there. Is he safe? No, he's not. Are you kidding me? He's an awesome God and awesome in scripture doesn't mean he's cool and rides a skateboard. He's awesome as inspi inspiring awe and fear. He's not safe, but he's good. And, and those things, when we keep those in correct balance, then you can have a correct relationship with him. My, my son said one time um, that he didn't grow up afraid of me except for when he did something wrong. When he was doing something wrong, he was afraid, but he had no reason to be afraid when he was doing what's right. And, and not that I'm God or trying to play God, but that's a correct relationship between a son and a father and, and teaching them to grow up and to love and fear God. And because he, he's not safe, but he's good. God is good, he's loving, he's holy, he, but he's just. He's a just God and, and he has to be feared. You know, I, uh, you know, this, the, the whole terminology of, you know, you know, Jesus is my personal savior. You know, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, a, a my pillow commercial, you know, he's comfortable. <laughs> you can lay your head, you can do whatever the hell you want. You're always going to be floating in this flowery bed of ease. And, um, and you know, Jesus, is my personal savior, he's right here in my pocket right now. And, uh, we forget that, um, you know, he's king of king kings and Lord of hosts. Lord of everything, and um, and any time. A message Bible I read yesterday said he's the commander of the an he's the commander of the angel armies. Come on, man, that's cool. And any time, uh, speaking of the angels, okay, we're not even talking about you know, uh, God. We're not talking about uh, Christophany. We're not talking about uh, the the ascended Lord of Hosts. We're talking about a created being like an angel. And oh, by the way. 
uh, Warriors and Wild Men listener, there's never in the scripture recorded a female angel. All of them rock up as these sword-bearing uh, angelic dudes. And that when, the, <laughs> when guys like John or somebody in the OT or one of the disciples got a glimpse of one of these beings, they felt like dead men. They were like. I thought they were going to die. They were like, "Hey, high five! Hey, you're my guardian angel." Well, Doug, they have they have way too many eyes. They have way too many wings. And when they're not hiding their face with their eyes with their wings, they're freaky looking. No, and what I'm, my, my my point is is that uh, a created being. Not, we're not even talking about you know the the triune Godhead. When people got a glimpse of that, they're just like, and they're just falling yeah. on their faces. And uh, I think we've, you know, again, and I don't want to get into this legalistic fear to where we're terrified of God. And I know people have had dads that terrified him and showed him no mercy. Can't play that card with God. He showed us mercy. He showed us love. He showed us grace. And some of you are like, I don't feel it now. Well, he showed it to you on the cross when he, when he uh, sacrificed his own son uh, yeah. for, for your BS. Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's kind of proof when you don't feel it. Run back to that. But when it comes to, uh, you know, why do you think you're, you're a minister? Uh, I, um, I got my ideas why I don't think it's preached. Um, why, do you think, um, <laughs> why do you think the lovelies in the pulpit uh, skip over that topic and get to the goodies? Well, because they haven't been to the coffee shop that I went to the other day. I was standing there in line to buy coffee, and I saw something there, and it was a little brown paper bag and it said nutsack. And uh, they haven't been to that coffee shop and they haven't picked up a nutsack yet. First of all, they don't have the balls to preach it because they don't have a nutsack. Yeah, and I think, I, to me, uh, Rich, you can't even properly preach the gospel until you preach the law. You can't, you can't preach mercy, you can't preach grace, you can't do it in such a way that you really feel it until, you know, Finney talked about it often, Paul, Paul uh, had a great uh, a rendition of the power of the law and the wrath of God in Romans 1 and Romans 7. And you don't even understand the aspect of forgiveness, of no condemnation, of justification, of imputed righteousness until you feel just like absolute garbage. And you yeah. want to shed uh, who you were. And that's the work of the law. That's the work of uh, the fear of God and his otherness and his holiness. And you, you extricate that from the gospel equation, and then you give them, you know, grace, mercy, love, and stuff. They're going to completely abuse it. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be something that they don't value. But you get somebody yep. who's completely uh, convicted of, <laughs> of their just desert of his wrath, and then they get uh, reprieved, and then they get forgiven. Oh, my God, you're going to find somebody who really loves uh, deeply, uh, like Jesus said, you got forgave much, you're going to love much. Well, good. Here, here's a good little analogy. What if you're out hiking, out in the forest, in the woods, and you get lost, but you don't know you're lost. You don't realize that you're lost yet. But you are. You don't know that you don't know your way back, but you're lost. And somebody runs up and finds you and rescues you. You're like, okay. And they're like, you were lost and now you're found. You're like, okay, whatever. You're not really that excited about it. But I'll tell you what, when you realize you're lost and you get the panic of I can't find my way home and I might not make it out of this and somebody finds you, you have a whole different uh, reaction and response to that. It's the same with God. I said too many times, you know, uh, what's the guy's name used to write the books on evangelism all the time? You remember that? He wrote all the evangelism books and how to do street evangelism and Oh, I can't think of his name. You know who I'm talking about. Dr. But anyway. anyway. Dr. Ken. Uh, uh, DJ. No, 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 no. Before that. Before that. Oh, gosh. And he would go to the college campuses and talk to the students and stuff. Yeah, Josh. Ray. Ray, Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort. Remember Ray Comfort. Comfort. He says, um, you can't understand the plan of salvation until you realize that you're lost. So the before you can preach the forgiveness of sins, you have to preach the law. They said, he said that we're, we're not Jews, we're Gentiles. We don't know the law. We don't know that, that we're responsible for breaking God's laws, the Ten Commandments. And he says, until you know that you're guilty and you're condemned, you can't understand the pardon, the forgiveness, the sanctification, the reconciliation. None of that means anything. And he says, and he quoted Spurgeon, he said, when you die 
if you don't know Christ, you don't understand that the Ten Commandments will be aimed at you like ten great cannons aimed at your soul, ready to send you to hell. And so people don't understand that. And so when they receive salvation, they're like, yeah, I mean, okay, I'll, yeah, man, I'll, I'll try Jesus like a cheap coat. You know, if it doesn't fit, you know, I'll try, I'll try something else. I'll try another religion, you know, whatever works for you. And that's where that theology comes from. That's why when you're preaching to a Buddhist, a Buddhist doesn't have any understanding for the need of Christ. And I'm not saying they're not smart, but based on Buddhist religion, they don't have an understanding of a need of a savior because in Buddhism, there's no sin. There's only karma, just, you know, little paybacks and what you do comes back on you, but they don't understand eternal condemnation. And so because of that, they don't understand the need of a savior. And the problem is, I think in our society today is that people are living in a Gentile spiritual culture uh, where nobody understands the law and what's required of the law and that we will be measured according to the law unless we give our lives to Christ. And so it has to start with the understanding of the law of God and the condemnation that comes with sin. And so that's and the fear of God's not preached. Then people get saved and they've never been rescued. They don't understand the awesomeness of God. Yeah, but I got. And so, how do we get that back in the church? See, I, I got a, I got a question. Uh, if they really got converted, because um, again, and I hate to uh, bring the Bible into it, but you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, what do you call it? A, we're all theologians, and um, yeah. you know, you're some either, people aren't good ones. <laughs> you're either good or you suck at it. But uh, you know, I, I constantly see, especially when, um, like when Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, when they prefigured and uh, spoke and. Uh, about the coming of the new covenant, it was always the first thing that um, preceded saving faith and always accompanied uh, after the conversion. You always, see, uh, you always see the new heart given in place of the heart of stone or the heart of flesh. And it always is accompanied by this thing called the fear of God. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but again, you, know, you're, you're, you, know, you, you brought up how uh, you know, the example of somebody in another religion or somebody who doesn't know diddly squat about Christ. And I, I lay the blame at the preacher, man. He's the, the minister has got to administer uh, the whole counsel of God the way that he lined it out in order for uh, the Holy Spirit to do the magic, to do the, the, the conversion process, if it's real, uh, in, in the individual's... Uh, in the individual's soul, and you can't, right. you can't freaking remove the. I mean, Paul said, Paul said he his motivation. He goes, I just love preaching Jesus. He goes, I just love bringing people to our personal Savior. Paul said, knowing the terror of God, I persuade men <laughs> to, yeah. to turn to turn from their crap. He didn't say knowing the love of the Lord. And again, you know, did he? Absolutely, he wrote the love chapter, but he said. That terror, when it's unleashed, especially from an eternal standpoint, they said, oh, I, I, I beg you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, let, let's take a story, Doug, that's preached all the time in churches um, and, and people that are, that are a little bit familiar with things of Scripture, but they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, a, a story they like to use a lot. The woman caught in adultery. They bring her to the feet of Jesus. The people, they're, they're standing there and saying, what are you going to do? Let's stone her. And Jesus says, he who's without sin, cast the first stone. Of course, they all drop the stones. They walk away. They're all gone. And then Jesus says, where are those who accuse you? She said, there are none, Lord. And he says, neither do I. And then he says this great thing. Go and sin no more. He didn't say, don't worry about it. It's okay. He didn't say that. He said, go and sin no more. Because he knows he's going to the cross. He's going to pay for that. But you can't continue in that life of sin, right? So people love that story. They love to say that. But they're forgetting another part of that. I told you this before. I don't know if I talked about it on the podcast, but I was talking to Dennis Peacock, and he, he's a lot higher level scholar than what I'll ever be in my life. And I told him, I said, hey, um, I think I know what Jesus was writing that day when they brought the woman to him. I know what he wrote in the sand. I think I know. And he kind of gets a smirk. He thinks I'm going to be sarcastic because he knows me a little bit. He thinks I'm going to tell a joke. And I said... I, I'm serious. And he says, okay, go ahead. And I said, well, when we read scripture, God only writes one thing. He wrote the law with his fingers, the Ten Commandments. He wrote, um, you've been weighed in the scales and you've been found wanting. 
The Bible says that he writes his law on our hearts. I said every time that God writes anything that we see in scripture, it's always the law. I said, I believe that Jesus stooped down and began writing the Ten Commandments. And every person around has been educated in that system of the law. They all know exactly what he's writing down. He doesn't have to move because they say he can only write 14 to 17 characters that they could read without actually getting up and moving and shifting. But they know exactly what's coming after that. And then he says, basically, he who is free from violating any of the law cast the first stone. And I told him that. You know what he said, Doug? He said, that is the finest argument I have ever heard for that scripture anywhere. He says, I have never read that. And he says, I think that's a great insight. And so I followed it up with this, Doug, because the Bible says this. I take it to another level. You probably know where the scripture is. The law is the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. The Pharisees represent the law. They bring a woman caught in adultery. They physically brought her to Christ. Christ writes down the law and confirms the law, but then what happens? It's, it's the clashing and crossing over of two dispensations. We're going from the law and now we're moving to when Christ is gonna be crucified and it's gonna become a time of grace where you can be forgiven of those things. And so she was very much grateful because she had been guilty of the law and was condemned. Come on, Doug. She was brought to not a judge, she was brought to the judge. Ju Jesus said, I'm not judging, but if I judge, you need to know that my judgment is true. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. He did not say you're not guilty. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And I think that's the place that we're missing in scripture is that God is just, God is holy. We have to be like that. And you have to understand it's not just free grace, it's repentance, coming to Christ and being forgiven. You know, another um, uh, another example that that I hear all the time, you know, and it's it's weird. I don't know if you've been to a lot of funerals, man. I'm sure you have. And uh, the older I get, the more that I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> um, have you have you ever been to a funeral where where every nobody goes to hell anymore? I mean, I, I went to this funeral one time and they're like, oh, you know, his. His favorite verse was John 14, you know, uh, this was his favorite hymn. And, you know, you know, he's he's in heaven right now walking around in white pinwad, you know, playing harps on clouds and eating ice cream with Jesus. And I'm like, bullshit. You, you have no idea. <laughs> I don't I don't even remember him talking about your church. I've been around him for 10 years. He's never mentioned you. And uh, as far as favorite Christ. favorite scripture, and, and then my friends were like, well, you know, the thief on the cross, Doug, the thief on the cross, he had, it's like he died in a, in a road rage Trans Am car wreck. You mean yeah. to tell me in that nanosecond before he ate a telephone pole, he's like, Lord, forgive me in Jesus' name, you know, and all of a sudden he's in heaven. Let's talk about the thief on the cross. When all the other the other two thieves are like, "Hey man, won't you if you're God, get us out of here. Come on, you know, you ain't Jesus. You can't even save yourself." And the thief on the cross, he said, he said this, Rich. He goes, "Do you not fear God?" Yeah. This man's innocent. We're here. We're <laughs> We're guilty, we're, man. Man, we're guilty. Don't you fear God? And Jesus goes, "Boom, this day you're going to be with me in paradise." Again, again, the fear of God preceding faith, uh, preceding uh, uh, that guy's justification. To, to me, and, and again, you know, this is a short podcast. There's a gazillion uh, verses that we could go to where fear of God, new covenant, new heart, or, you know, they're all yeah. intertwined together. Uh, let me bring this up, man, because <clears throat> this happened to me. Uh, young preacher flying all over the world, half a million miles on American Airlines, platinum status, Admiral's Club, good Lord Rich, I'm living the high life with zero, the dream. with zero fear of God. And he came, ooh, and man, he delivered it back into me. And, and uh, you know what, as a jaded young minister, I'm so glad that he derailed my life. I remember sitting in class, man, with Dr. Sproul. Sitting in class with Dr. Sproul, he's talking, to, uh, we're talking about uh, the doctrine of God, the, the first... Thing you know about the 
God or the first thing that theology proper puts to you is his incomprehensibility, his otherness, uh, his holiness. And I, was, I had my little nifty notebook out. I still remember it, lime green cover. Had me, a, had me a, a, one of those Sharpie fine point pens. And he starts talking about the fear of God that I'd lost as a minister. And I, I hope I can find those uh, journals. We packed them when we moved from Miami to uh, Austin. I couldn't even write, man. I was terrified. I thought it was, I thought it was gonna mm-hmm. die. I, you know, I was like, I'm having a heart attack. It was a panic attack. It was a fear of God attack. And in that classroom, unbeknownst to uh, you know, the 14 or 15 students in there, Dude, I wouldn't say that I was—I uh, got born again and I was self-deceived, but I—I had—I uh, had an experience like my conversion, where it's like, holy crap, have I gone completely uh, off the rails in regards to my view of whom I'm dealing with? And uh, I thank God for it, brother. I mean, it was—it was heavy, heavy stuff. Uh, I knew God loved me, but I, I knew he was going to set me straight in regards to who he, who he is. And, um, yeah, you can lose the fear. But those are the experiences that God reveals himself to us. And sometimes using somebody to teach and preach that stuff to you that causes us to reconsider. That's God's love, man, bringing you back in. That's what he does. You know, I was <clears throat> speaking about Sproul, and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can dig up the link. <clears throat> I didn't bookmark it, but it'll be easy to find. I was, uh, I was listening to uh, a series that he was doing at one of his Ligonier uh, conferences two years ago. <clears throat> and um, it was on uh, post-Christian uh, Christianity. And he was going into uh, all the reasons why uh, Christianity has uh, <laughs> abandoned Christianity and is into some kind of therapeutic stuff that has, you know, dog crap all to do uh, with true Christianity. Then he moves into uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, talking about the, the narrow road and the broad way. And brother, I'm telling you right here now, that sermon, because it's, it's very philosophical. He's talking about the influence of Immanuel Kant and how he influenced theology and, and how uh, relativism was then spawned. And then how Christianity just said, yay, and they took a big you know, plate and asked for seconds. But when he moves into that stuff about, he, go, he, he told the audience, there's people in here that you think you're saved and you're not. You're deceived. And you're going to wake up in hell. And, uh, it, and there, there will be eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. The weepers are going to be the ones who thought that they were right with God and they weren't. The gnashers are the ones that are anti-theistic. They hate him and they're going to be in perpetual rage for all eternity. And, uh, brother, I don't know if you've ever read Jonathan Edwards' uh, treatise, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, but I don't know if it was just me. I don't know if it'll affect you the same way, but I was painting while I'm listening. It's like, hey, I'm going to catch up on some sprawl. I'm going to get some good intel. I'm going to become smarter, hipper Christian. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be able to be more glib in conversations when it's talking about Jesus and the Bible and theology. I, I nearly dropped my paintbrush because you could feel the fear of God descending into yeah. the, into the studio, and I, you know, I've seen Sproul move into those realms before, but I don't know, you know, I mean, he was dead, you know, eighteen months later. And I don't know if he had, you know, that <laughs> that knowledge that it's coming, it's coming like a yeah. freight train. One of the most sober, scary messages that I've ever heard. Again, you don't think it's coming because he's, you know, doing the highfalutin twenty dollar words in the philosophical yeah. stuff, but man, oof. He pulled the net, and oh my gosh, man, one of the most powerful messages. And I was sitting there thinking, man, that's the reason why I brought up this, uh, or, or Zeke tossed this topic, and I was like, yes, let's talk about that, is I can't remember the last time I heard anybody really lay the leather to the ass of the believer and get them to you know, shore up that aspect that they've been neglecting about God's nature and character. Well, I can tell you that churches are avoiding that topic because it doesn't build big churches and in our church we have a week every year that we call week of fire and and it's really we call it the week of fire that's the name of it but it's a week of sanctification and in that week we focus on the fear of God we focus on repentance it's not about anything and anybody else it's about me and my relationship with Jesus we need to shut it all down we don't have any other ministry that week we don't do cell groups that week we don't do anything that week we go, we worship, and the word is focused on you getting your personal 
relationship and your life in line with God. And that preaching is hardcore. And you want to know something, Doug? I'm, I'm proud of our church. I, you know, I didn't grow up in church, and the culture of our church is different than a lot of churches. Some of it's good. Some of it, you know, I, I could have done better. But I'll tell you something. That is the most attended event that we have in our church. It is, Doug, it's the most highest, not only the most attended, the most look, people that look forward to that event more than any other event. It's the most anticipated. You know why, Doug? Because I believe that's inside of us, man. That's deep calling to deep right there. It's like, hey, man, let's get back to the deal. And I believe that if Christians, and, and I'm with you, I'm blaming it on the pastors. If I believe that if Christians had the chance, if they had the opportunity to hear it and an opportunity to respond, I believe even the casual Christians that show up at those times would come back to that place because, man, the fear of God puts you in that right relationship with them again. And it also reminds you how much he loves us because, again, he's not safe, but he's good. And, and that's one of the things we really love about him. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. And, and this is not about how awesome my preaching was, but it was about how awesome God showed up. I was preaching at a conference. It was in the Philippines, about 50 some thousand people. We had to do two sessions. And in one of the sessions I was preaching and I don't, I don't even remember what I was preaching. Again, it's not about what I was preaching. But when I started praying at the end and ministering, the, the spirit of God showed up and there was a fear of God that came on the place. And I said, if anybody wants to come to the altar, it wasn't an altar call for salvation. If anyone, you need to answer this, you need to respond. Doug, not even kidding. 9,000 people were at the altar. And you know what? This is the crazy part. And like I said, I don't even remember what I preached. It wasn't about that. Doug, I put the microphone in my back pocket, turned it off, put it in my pocket. I, and the stage is like 15 or 20 feet high, right? In the conference that big. I walked down the stairs to the front and didn't even realize I had answered my own altar call because the presence of God was there and I was convicted. I, it didn't matter, I was done. I literally was standing in the front with my hands up, Doug, tears running down my face, thinking, man, I gotta be right with God because it's not even, look, it's not about the preacher, it's about the word of God, it's about the presence of God, it's about the fear of God. I was standing there, Doug, receiving ministry at my own altar call. And when I'm standing there, after probably 10 or 15 minutes, I don't know how long, somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, Pastor, what should we do next? And I was like, oh, wait, I'm, I, I gotta figure out what to do here, you know? So I had to, I went back up and we worshiped. I actually just told him, let's go into worship. And, and we went into that because I felt like it was the right thing to do. The time for talking had ended. The time for responding and, and dealing with the presence of God had come. And, and I'm gonna tell you, Doug, it's a weird thing when God shows up and you answer your own altar call. You know he's in that place. And I wasn't there trying to be holy and spiritual. I was there just trying to be holy. I was like, Jesus, here I am. You know who I am. I'm standing right here with the rest of the people just trying to get my Jesus on. You know what I mean? <clears throat> you know, another thing that, um, and that's a beautiful thing. And uh, I remember Ravenhill one time, he, he did some heavy duty message on uh, the judgment seat of Christ. And everybody starts filing down and everybody's repenting. And uh, the minister that was hosting Ravenhill, he goes, what do we do now? And he goes, I don't know. You just receive. <laughs> he goes, he goes, stand on your head. I don't know. You know, just, just let, just, there doesn't have to be soothing music. There doesn't have to be, you know, glib uh, aphorisms and cliches doled out to the people. Just let them freaking absorb, you know, that feeling in the moment. Because again, that kind of stuff is precious. And I don't mean like precious, I mean, it's valuable. The stuff that, and, and they're, they're, it's more rare than it should be. Yeah, I mean, the, like I said, I lost the fear of God, man. And uh, you get other guys like David, they lost it. Solomon lost it. And you look at Ecclesiastes, which Solomon wrote at the, <laughs> at the end of his life. He's like, hey, man, you know, the reading of many books, ah, it's tiresome. He said, at the end of the day, fear God and keep his commandments. He goes, that'll save your ass, you know. Yeah. Here's, yeah. here's, here's the upshot. Um, uh, don't want to end on too terrible of note, uh, and I'm not trying to be like uh, Joel Osteen, but the upshot of the fear of God is that when it really hits you and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's percolating just as powerful as all his other, you know, quote-unquote, non negative uh attributes uh when you fear him you don't fear men you don't fear devils you don't fear you know what the world's gonna say or do i mean you look at examples like paul and john the baptist jesus they're like we're gonna kill your bodies like i'm already dead do it kiss my ass <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna slingshot me to where i want to go 
And so yeah. you're, you're not going to keep me from saying what needs to be said. You're not going to you're not going to cow me in, into obedience to some stale idol of the system. It's like I'm fearing God, man, and it's it's liberating to to live in uh, that kind of uh, that kind of cloud of where your respect is solely tied up in his nature and character, and you don't give a flippity gibbet about what men say or think. You know, that's that's liberating. That's freedom, man. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Doug, my my last my last thought on this topic is a quote from Leonard Ravenhill, who I know you knew, and I'm jealous about that. I've said that a hundred times, but I'll say it again. But this is what he said, and I'll, this is my last thought on it. There's one thing we need above everything else. It's something we don't talk about these days. We need a mighty avalanche of conviction of sin. We're living in an unprecedented day when evil is no longer evil. We've changed the terminology. Iniquity is now infirmity. Wickedness is now wicked weakness. Devilry is now deficiency. And I think that's where we're at, Doug. I think that's what's going on. You know, Jesus didn't die for your mistakes. He died for your sin. Our God is a holy God. And we gotta we gotta approach him like that. Yeah, and, and if I uh, you know, people are like, well, I don't like that, you know. Tough crap, man. It's who God is. He's immutable. Uh, <laughs> it ain't going to go away. And the sooner, you know, we can, again, and, and we're doing it, you know, from from the sure foundation of being accepted into the beloved. And But it, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we blow it off or we negate, you know, that side of God. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, David said um, in Psalm 36, he said, when the people lost the fear of God, uh, sin spoke to their heart. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a cudgel, man. Not only does it keep you from fearing men, but it also keeps you from doing stupid stuff. When nobody's, yeah. when nobody's watching and you've got the audience of one there, I mean, it's, it's a great deterrent to, to all the sins of the flesh. And I don't know why, I don't know why, um, uh, well, I do know why. And I think, it's, uh, I think it's a bastardization of the minister's calling I think it's prostitution for, for money over substance. And I think a lot of these guys uh, have been propped up as a deluding and a deceiving influence to, to basically, you know, blind and damn people who really don't want the truth, you know, yeah. embodied in Christ. What's a warrior and wild man supposed to do, buddy? Go to warriorsandwildmen.com. Uh, sign up for the podcast. Follow us. Hey, also, um, uh, uh, Play this message to your men's group. I'd love to hear feedback on this, guys. I'd, I'd get a group of guys, yeah. sit around, and uh, if, you're, if you're not hearing the fear of God uh, from the pulpit um, or any other supplemental teaching that you get, definitely not going to be on a TED Talk. Uh, play this and uh, let us hear your feedback on it. Play it and then kick it around in a men's group and see the good stuff that's going to come out of it. Yeah. Amen, brother. Always a pleasure, Rich. Arrivederci. Good talk to you, Doug. Stay rowdy, buddy.